All righty. So in the last lecture, we introduced this idea of transactions uh, as one way to uh, encapsulate the operations that someone needs to perform on a database. Uh, one, uh, as a way of encapsulating one kind of uh, isolated transformation uh, to the data that you store in a database. And we went over some properties uh, that we wanted to enforce uh, around transactions. Uh, so we wanted to enforce that transactions would be uh, atomic. In other words, they either apply in, in their entirety or they uh, don't apply at all. Uh, we wanted them to be consistent. In other words, uh, we wanted to make sure that they didn't transform the data in some way that uh, violated our assumptions about the data. The data. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they were isolated. In other words, uh, that one transaction uh, would never see the effects uh, of another transaction unless that transaction had completed uh, entirely. And we wanted to uh, ensure durability, uh, namely that once a transaction said that everything was uh, safe and persisted on disk, uh, everything was actually safe and persisted on disk. And we started talking about uh, two of these issues in particular, uh, atomicity and isolation, and uh, started talking about ways to enforce them. And for the most part, we've been talking so far uh, about isolation, namely uh, ensuring that each transaction uh, occurs in its own little world, that it sees a consistent view of the world uh, that's unhindered by what other transactions are trying to uh, do at the same time. And there's a couple of things that uh, could potentially have uh, gone wrong. Uh, so for example, uh, one transaction might uh, read the effects of another transaction, uh, and then that, sec that uh, previous transaction decides to uh, abort or, or uh, just give up. Uh, in which case, uh, transaction two has now read a state that never actually existed in the first place. Um, another thing that could potentially go wrong is that one transaction performs a read, uh, in this case on A, uh, makes a modification, and then another, uh, the, the original transaction, uh, comes along and, and reads, essentially over the course of the, the transaction, reads two distinct values uh, for uh, some variable, some uh, cell or column or, or uh, some value in, in the database. And uh, we want to make sure, I mean, this essentially breaks the, the, the illusion that the transaction is the only thing in the system, uh, that there's, there aren't any, any other transactions uh, trying to, to change the, the state. Um, and there's also the possibility that if you perform uh, two writes, uh, two transactions come along and both of them perform writes, uh, you want to make sure that all of the writes performed by a given transaction are reflected uh, consistently throughout the entire database. Uh, so you don't want to have um, a write from transaction one uh, that's, that's visible uh, at the same time that a uh, one of the two writes the transaction one performs visible, and one of the two writes the transaction two performs uh, visible, because that kind of creates this uh, inconsistent state to the rest of the world, that um, you don't actually have uh, a sense whether transaction one or transaction two came first. So we came up with this, uh, in order to help uh, preserve uh, our, our sanity and, and uh, make sure that we had some uh, precise way of, of specifying what we meant by uh, correct behavior from transactions, uh, we came up with this idea of a schedule. Uh, in other words, a sequence of reads and write operations uh, that a particular transaction might apply. And we came up with this, or that multiple transactions might apply. And we came up with this notion of a serial schedule in other words, a, a schedule where all of the uh, read and write operations are uh, performed without interleaving. So you perform everything that transaction one needs to do first, then you perform everything that transaction two needs to do, then transaction three, transaction four. So uh, a serial schedule is just any schedule where you complete one transaction at a time. And uh, to define correctness, 
we came up with this idea of a serializable schedule. Uh, in other words, a schedule that, under some constraints, uh, was equivalent to a serial schedule. Um, in other words, a, a, a schedule that was that's guaranteed to produce exactly the same output as a serial schedule. Uh, now, figuring out uh, figuring out uh, what a particular schedule uh, is is going to do, or sorry, what a particular transaction is going to do is impossible. Uh, so in order to uh, make the, uh, the, the problem of finding a serializable schedule uh, tractable, we came up with a couple of simplifications. Um, uh, constraints on uh, what a transaction can do that will uh, ensure that that transaction produces a serializable schedule. And just to, to emphasize this point, uh, the, these are simplifications that are guaranteed to produce serializable schedules, but uh, may identify some schedules that are technically serializable as not being serializable. We do this in order to make things, uh, make the problem tractable. And uh, the, the first one that we came up with, the first notion of equivalence that we came up with, was this idea of conflict equivalence, that uh, if uh, two transactions modified data, or one transaction modified and the other transaction read the data, that all of these, the, the reads and writes uh, that two transactions uh, perform uh, happen in the same order, um, on the same objects. Uh, so if you have transaction one, it performs a bunch of reads, and transaction two performs a bunch of reads, that you have some sort of consistent ordering over, uh, over those. Either all of the reads for transaction one come before the corresponding, sorry, all of the, the writes in transaction one come before all of the writes in transaction two, uh, or vice versa. And um, as we discussed in the last lecture, uh, the, the guarantee that we're uh, trying to provide is that the, uh, the series of operations, uh, sorry, the, the schedule uh, of operations is equivalent to some serial schedule. Um, you're allowed to reorder transactions, but you're not allowed to reorder the effects. Uh, let me rephrase that. You're allowed to reorder uh, the order of the transactions, but you're not allowed to uh, create the uh, from the, the system's perspective, from the, the perspective of correctness, uh, it doesn't care whether transaction one comes before transaction two. Um, all it cares about is that uh, you end up with effects that are equivalent to transaction one entirely completed first, then transaction two, uh, or vice versa. So conflict equivalence is one way of doing this. Uh, but we also noted that there were some uh, corner cases where you can actually simplify your life a lot. Um, namely, when you had one transaction whose effects got hidden by another transaction. So if we have this schedule here where transaction one performs a read, then a write, transaction two performs a write, and then transaction three performs another write, uh, nominally this would not be conflict equivalent because transaction two's write uh, comes after uh, transaction one's read, but also uh, after, uh, also before transaction one's write. So there's no consistent, uh, there, there's no way that I can uh, order transaction one and transaction two so that I get exactly the same externally visible effects. But uh, because of the fact that transaction three comes along and performs a write of its own, now uh, we've essentially hidden the fact that transaction two uh, performed this out of order write. Transaction three basically obscures everything that uh, transaction two did. Uh, in other words, the order of those two operations is irrelevant because uh, it gets completely uh, overwritten anyway. And so this got us to this notion of view serializability. Uh, in other words, uh, two schedules are view equivalent uh, if all of the reads come from the same place and uh, all of the writes go to the same place or are completely hidden. Um, so this ends up being essentially the uh, mechanism that most uh, databases use. Creates some weird effects, obviously, because uh, you're essentially allowing transaction two uh, to 
kind of squeeze into that slot between T1 and T3. Um, and this ends up creating some weird out of order uh, events. Um, you're essentially allowing transaction two to say, I am, I am safely on disk, I am, I'm durable, uh, when transaction three uh, has essentially come along and, and overrode it. So, yeah. Um, but this is, from the perspective of the outside world, um, pretty much every single, uh, the, these schedules are essentially equivalent. Okay, so this gets us to some notion of correctness. This gets us an idea of, uh, of how we can prove to ourselves that some implementation that we, we make uh, actually has, um, is actually correct. Um, so if we say that uh, some implementation is, uh, guarantees serializability in general, well, that's a pretty tall order, basically says that it doesn't, uh, that, that we're guaranteed to get, uh, that we're guaranteed to be able to interleave, uh, to use this implementation to interleave operations uh, in such a way that we're guaranteed to always get output, uh, get a consistent output, uh, an output that is consistent with some serial schedule. On the other hand, uh, in general, what you're going to see is most uh, implementations are either going to be conflict, view serializable, or, well, if something is view serializable, it's guaranteed to be conflict serializable since view serializability is uh, strictly more permissive than, uh, than conflict serializability. Okay, uh, but that doesn't actually tell you anything about the uh, implementations. Um, oh, oops. That did not that got in there. Um, that doesn't actually tell us anything about the implementation. Um, what we'd ultimately like to do is be able to just straight up uh, detect, or we'd like to basically come up with some sort of implementation that guarantees uh, that any schedule that we actually execute ends up satisfying one of these serializabil serializability guarantees. And so we basically end up with uh, two, uh, broadly speaking, uh, there, there are two general strategies that you can take towards uh, avoiding, uh, avoiding these kinds of conflicts. Um, we can either kind of be optimistic, allow schedules to, to execute um, whatever order we want and then kind of check after the fact to see if we've done anything. Or we can be conservative and um, kind of keep an eye on, on what's happening at, in the system at any given point in time. And if we're ever getting into a, a situation where uh, a transaction might do something weird, we, we either try and avoid it outright or we uh, prevent the transaction for, from uh, proceeding. So let's look at that first one, because that essentially boils down to how do we use locks to enforce uh, conservative, uh, to enforce uh, one of these kinds of, um, of serializability guarantees. So we'd like to uh, first off be able to ensure that the uh, locks, we'd like to prove to ourselves that uh, some locking scheme guarantees uh, conflict uh, serializability. And we'd like to uh, look at whether there are any potential problems that arise from this. So at the end of last lecture, we discussed two-phase locking a little bit, and we came to the conclusion that two-phase locking could uh, essentially guarantee uh, conservative, uh, could guarantee um, uh, which I'm gonna call it, uh, could guarantee uh, the, uh, I am out of it today, uh, could guarantee conflict equivalence. Um, so let's do a really quick example here. Um, in, in effect, what we're trying to do with uh, conflict equivalence is to make sure that uh, there's the order of the transactions is basically consistent. 
So you can model this by generating a, a sort of graph. And um, every time a, a transaction tries to modify some sort of, uh, of a data structure or uh, object in the database, you take out a lock on that object, and if there's ever um, if two transactions try and modify the same object or access the same object, you want to make sure that there is a consistent ordering over all of those uh, over all of those operations. So, for example, here we have uh, here we have uh, a write from transaction one on B and a read from transaction two on B as well. So we can create an edge uh, going from transaction one to transaction two, basically saying, uh, sorry, other way around, uh, transaction uh, two to transaction one, saying that transaction two uh, performed an operation on B conceptually before transaction one performed an operation on B. And similarly, transaction three performed an operation or two operations on D before transaction two uh, performed an operation on D. So the, the kind of dependencies that uh, we create, transaction th uh, two depends on transaction three or feeds into transaction three feeds into transaction two. Um, this graph ends up being acyclic. Uh, there's no, uh, there's no, there's essentially consistent order uh, for these operations. Uh, transaction three uh, come, if you take transaction three, execute it in its entirety first, then execute uh, transaction two entirely, then execute transaction one entirely, uh, you're going to get essentially the same effect, the same externally visible effects uh, as if uh, you had uh, executed this particular schedule. And you can use locking uh, to uh, preserve this uh, sort of consistency because anytime you take out a lock, you're essentially guaranteeing that that particular object is never going to be used until you uh, until the transaction uh, that takes out the lock uh, is fully complete. So in this case, transaction three takes out a lock on uh, takes out a lock on uh, D performs a read on D, performs a write on D, releases the lock on D, um, that's going to ensure that uh, transaction 2 can't perform a read on D until transaction 3 is done. So locking basically guarantees uh, serializability, Com uh, guarantees conflict serializability. Now, there's a little bit of a difference between those schedules because um, transaction two, let's go back. Nope, uh, my mistake. All right. Right. Um, let's take a slight variation of this example.
slightly simplified form of this example. Where I do a uh, first a read on A, then a read, then transaction two does a read on B, transaction two does a read on A, transaction one does a write on B. Now, in principle, this schedule is uh, conflict serial. In principle, the schedule is serializable. Um, transaction two doesn't actually change uh, the state of the database. So, in spite of the fact that there is uh, conflict uh, in the ordering of uh, the relevant events, so T1 uh, T2, and T2 then has an edge back to T1, this is a, a cycle. In spite of the fact that we have these, um, the two transactions aren't actually uh, technically conflicting. And the reason for this is that the reads uh, don't actually change uh, the, the state of the system. Uh, so, what we care about um, is conflicts between writes and conflicts between writes and reads. Uh, pairs of reads can essentially be performed at the same time. So, I'm sure uh, most of you have already encountered the notion of uh, reader-writer locks. Um, another common term for these is what's called uh, is uh, what's called shared and exclusive locks. So, uh, uh, I'll bore you with the details, but the, uh, the short version is that a shared lock can be shared by multiple entities, uh, multiple transactions, excuse me. Uh, so, uh, any number of transactions can have a shared lock or a, a reader lock, um, but only uh, one transaction can have an exclusive lock. And if a transaction has an exclusive lock, no other transaction can have a shared uh, lock. Okay, um, any questions up to this point? Yeah? Can you go over again the significance of the edges and the gram? Oh, sure. So we can come up with um, a dependency graph. Um, Recall that uh, we're going to call a schedule serializable if it's equivalent, under some definition, uh, to a serial schedule. Uh, so another way of, of looking at that is that, that if I can put together a list of all of the, um, let's use an example. Uh, yeah, let's just use that one. Um, So if we wanted to prove to ourselves that this was equivalent to some serial schedule, a reasonable strategy would be to figure out what serial uh, schedule uh, it had to correspond to. Uh, one way to do that is to look at each of these operations, uh, or each of the pairs of operations on a particular uh, object, uh, A, B, C, and D, as uh, establishing constraints. So I've got three transactions, one, T2, and T3. So let's look at all of the objects, um, A. So A is only accessed once. We're safe. If only one transaction ever touches it, great. B, so B is accessed twice. There's this read and this write. So I can essentially kind of say that transaction two performed its read before transaction one in this schedule. So that means that whatever order I come up with, 
transaction two has to come before transaction one. And I can model that in a graph where I have one node for every transaction by putting an edge from T2 to T1. So this basically says T2 has to come before T1 because of this. What else is, so I've got three operations on D. Got an, uh, transaction three performs a read, then a write. I don't really care about uh, edges within a given transaction. Transaction comes at the same time as the transaction. Uh, but I care about uh, potential conflicts between transaction three and transaction uh, two. Now, again, I don't really care about conflicts on reads, but I care about conflicts on reads and writes. So I've got a write on D here and a read on D here. The D that I would read here is the one that transaction three wrote. So I have an edge from this right to this read. And again, that basically places a constraint on the serial schedule that I can come up with. Uh, in this case, transaction three must come before transaction two. So now, if I add another operation here, let's say I do a read on A here, creating another edge here, I'm basically imposing a constraint that transaction one has to come before transaction two. In other words, I've got a bad edge, I've got a cycle here, and basically this, uh, this graph is not one that I can use to define an order over the transactions, because transaction one has to come before transaction two, vice versa. Similarly, I do a read on a here, so again, I'm imposing a constraint on myself that transaction one comes before transaction three, and same deal. I have a cycle in the graph. There's no order that I can place on, on these that would guarantee that they're all going to occur in, uh, that there's no order I can place these in uh, that would make uh, the output equivalent to what I'd get from here. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I really try. Um, the 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 plan is there. Uh, the time is not. Um, if someone wants to edit the videos, I'd be happy to share. Um, if there are any volunteers, uh, if not, I will get to them as soon as I can. All right, well, uh, thank Hank. <laughs> um, we'll chat. Mm -hmm. Just a question about negative power. Yeah. T1 didn't have that right read. This read? The right. The right. right. Yeah. Which means you only have the RA. Mm -hmm. So that would make that edge go away. Right. And then the last RA that you wrote, that was to actually, that was gone, right? T3 doesn't really have a place. Oh, so both of these are gone. Yeah. Then. Maybe it doesn't matter where T3 goes. Yep. Does that. So this, this defines what's called a. Uh, this graph defines what's called. Or if it defines a partial order, then we're good. Um, in this case, yeah, T3 can either go before, it can basically go anywhere in this, this uh, order. Doesn't matter. This is just a graph of the constraints, the limitations. Uh, that that schedule imposes on us. No, no. If uh, if it's a partial order, I mean, we can impose as many edges. We can add. These are just constraints. We can always add more constraints on ourselves if we want. Um, but yeah, you're right. Other questions. Okay, um, right. So what locking does is it basically forces us to move, to delay uh, execution of, of one of these, these operations until uh, much later. 
Um, and in effect guarantees uh, conflict uh, serializability. Okay. Um, so there's one other question that um, is, is worth asking here. And you'll note that I've been very vague on what exactly it is that we're locking. Uh, A's, B's, what, what exactly is an A or a B? Any, any thoughts? Okay, so when you're writing, what could you be writing to? To the tuples, okay, I could write to a tuple. What else could I, yeah? To a memory address, uh, or a cell, or something, yeah. Could I be writing to a t an entire table? Could I be writing to a cell of data? Now, uh, what, why would I, uh, or, uh, I could, in principle, uh, I'm, I'm modifying any of these. In principle, I could use any of them as, uh, as the thing that I lock. So if I lock the, the table anytime I write to it, that brings me some benefits and, and drawbacks compared to locking individual rows or individual cells. Why would I want to lock the table? Why would I want to lock the cells? Yeah? You lock the cells, um, there be multiple heads to a table currently? Well, you can. Uh, I can take out locks on as many cells as I want and make right. sure that I have all of them locked before I uh, perform a, a, a change. Right, but like on the same table, like if like two, two um, transactions on a single table, but two different cells, if you, have a table, if you have a lock on the table, one would have to wait on the other. If you lock on the cell, you would have to wait. Ah, okay. So if I'm locking at uh, the, the granularity of cells, transactions that are modifying uh, different cells within my table uh, can be concurrent. Okay, so great. We want to use uh, update, uh, we want to lock cells. Anyone want to argue with me? Okay, so what if I have an update that has to update all of the, the rows in a table? or one, all of the, the values uh, in one column of a, of a table. I have to take out a lock on millions or billions of rows. Millions or billions of locks. That, that's going to make for a very, very sad lock manager. Um, so, okay, I've got this nice advantage that um, I could lock, uh, when I lock individual cells, uh, because Multiple transactions that are working on the same data can operate at the same time. On the other hand, if I have operations that lock, that uh, modify huge amounts of data, then I kind of want to lock an entire table at a time and not uh, worry about these these individual uh, individual cells or individual rows. So, how do we get around this? Well. Um, We already have some notion of a hierarchy. We've got relations that we can group uh, sets of tuples into blocks that we put onto a uh, disk together. Uh, we, can, we then have individual tuples, and then within the tuples we have individual cells. So what if we had some way to kind of lock just the level in this hierarchy uh, in such a way that um, it would kind of it would work. If I had one transaction that locked, let's say, tuple one, um, it would prevent an another transaction that wanted to lock relation one, but it wouldn't prevent another transaction that wanted to lock tuple five. And so the idea behind this is what's called hierarchical locks. And um, so right now we basically have uh, this notion of locks that has uh, two modes. So we can, uh, or sorry, three modes. So the lock is either unlocked, shared, or exclusive. Actually, let me. 
me create a little bit more space here. And for ourselves that uh, describes what we're allowed to do and when. So if the object starts out being unlocked, well, we're allowed to take pretty much anything on it. The object already uh, is in a shared, uh, has a shared lock on it. We can take a shared, but not an exclusive. And if it has an exclusive on it, then we're not allowed to do anything. So let me pose a really quick uh, kind of hypothetical. One transaction so we have one transaction that wants to uh, do a write on tuple one and another transaction uh, transaction two that wants to do a write on tuple on relation one, and uh, a third transaction, transaction three, that wants to do a write on uh, tuple three. So, so we want to do a modification to tuple one, modification to tuple three, and a modification to relation one. So these two, I can probably allow, right? That one, well, that's going to conflict with both tuple one and tuple two. So what do I do about this? Well, what if I kind of use shared locks? I mean, in, in, in essence, that's what's going on here, right? I want to uh, kind of share. Uh, tuple one wants to share access to relation one. Wants to share access to block one. And it only wants to actually modify tuple one. Now, what would happen if I did that? Well, I take out a shared lock here. I take out a shared lock here. And I take out an exclusive lock here. Yeah, so let's hypothetically say that T1, uh, transaction one, uh, took out first a shared lock on relation one, then a shared lock on block one, and then a shared lock on, uh, on transact, on tuple. Uh, and then the same thing happened with uh, transaction three as well. Uh, whereas transaction two would just try and get an exclusive lock on relation one. Does that? Anyone see potential problems with this? Yeah? Um, why is the first one 
not getting the block on the block. Uh, why is transaction one? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Potential problems with this? So what happens if I have another transaction come along? basically says I'm allowing multiple things to take out a lock on the object at the same time, right? So shared lock on relation one. Yes. Problem. Um, so this hypothesis here that let's say I were to take out a, a shared lock doesn't actually cut it because I'm actually modifying relation one. This operation is actually changing uh, relation one. On the other hand, I still want multiple transactions to be able to change parts of relation one. So what we end up doing is extending our idea of a lock to include two New, uh, two new concepts. So we've got uh, the, the lock could be unlocked, shared, or exclusive. Now we're going to add two new lock modes that say, I am not locking this specific object, but I'm going to take out a lock on one of its descendants. We're going to call those intent locks. So when we take out a lock here, we're basically going to signal that while we're not actually interested in locking R1 in its entirety, we're going to be modifying it. So I'm going to call that an intent to exclude. Similarly for block 1, we're going to take out an intent to exclude on block 1. Now, when transaction 4 comes along and says, I'd like to perform a read on all of relation 1, or I'd like to lock relation 1 for reading, we have this idea here that the relation 1 is already locked. So we can generalize that uh, picture a little bit and uh, come up with kind of this big, uh, this big kind of uh, graph of what locks we want versus what locks uh, the other transactions have. And um, well, essentially that's, that's it. The intent to exclude lock uh, is not compatible with a shared lock on uh, the object. The intent to share lock is not compatible with uh, an exclusive lock on the object. Um, so, uh, any questions so far? Yeah. So, like, uh, higher level, what's, what, what do we get if intent to share? So you take, uh, 
So uh, looking at the, the hierarchy, relation or database, then relation, then block, then uh, row, then, then cell. Um, in order to, to use this approach, you'd start at the top of that hierarchy and take out intent blocks until you get to the level of granularity that you actually care about. So in this case, transaction one is specifically interested in modifying tuple one, so it would first take out an intent to exclude lock on relation one, intent to exclude lock on relation two, and exclusive lock on tuple one. Uh, same thing goes if it wanted to read from tuple one. In that case, it would take out an intent to share lock on relation one, intent to share on block one, and then an intent to, uh, then an actual shared lock on, uh, on uh, tuple one. Why would it be bad if it just took out shared all the way through from the top of the uh, It wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be wrong, but it would kill some of the benefits that you get from, uh, from what you're, you're trying to do here. Uh, so a shared lock is, for obvious reasons, not compatible with an intent to exclude lock. So same same uh, deal with transaction four. If you wanted to take out a shared lock on, on this, well, it's getting modified. Whereas in intent to share lock means that you're not actually trying to read from the entire object. Uh, it just means that you're trying to, to read from some more granular component of now, and what that means is that somewhere along the line, you'll, you'll take out a shared lock. Somewhere along the hierarchy, you'll, you'll take out a shared lock. And if there is a conflict, it'll get caught when you take out that shared lock. But it'll get caught at the level of granularity that you, you kind of, um, that you kind of want to catch it. Uh, essentially, an intent lock is a signal that there is some someone trying to do something at a lower level of granularity, whether it's exclude or, or, uh, or lock. Uh, sorry, whether it's exclude or, or, or share. Um, but yeah, so you could, uh, it would be correct to uh, go down the entire stack taking up shared locks, but then you basically get blocked on this, this first operation. Um, whereas if you had a, a transaction that wanted to read from couple two, for example, uh, transaction five wants to uh, read from tuple two. We want to allow that because uh, or is it, that's going to conflict with transaction two, which wants to write to the relation. It's going to uh, actually it's allowed to coexist with transaction four. Um, but here, uh, the reason that we take out intent to share blocks going all the way down the stack is because uh, we don't want to conflict with an intent to uh, exclude all the way down the stack. We want this to coexist with one and three. Yeah. Uh, are any hotbox stacks uh, supposed to help with starvation? Uh, are intent locks uh, supposed to help with starvation? Um, that's possible, although I don't see the direct connection. Um, the main advantage that comes to mind is just that uh, because you're taking out blocks at lower levels of granularity, uh, more transactions can coexist in the system at the same time. Okay, because I, I don't really understand, like, right now, uh, intent locks. Uh, so think of an intent lock as kind of a, a, a flag. Um, you No, well, kind of. Um, so ultimately what you're trying to do is if you're modifying tuple one, you don't want to prevent anyone from modifying block two or block three or tuple two or tuple three. You want to prevent anyone from actually modifying uh, anything along the hierarchy uh, going up the tree. You don't want to, you don't want anyone to if you're modifying tuple one, it's kind of like you're modifying block one, and it's kind of like you're modifying uh, relation one, but at the same time, you don't want to prevent anyone from modifying, uh, you don't want that to stop anyone from trying to modify block two. 
Block two is okay, block one and relation one are not. So an intent lock is kind of a, a essentially a little trail of breadcrumbs going down the down the hierarchy saying, oh by the way, there's there's some a uh, good analogy would be uh, road closed sign. So if uh, road closed local traffic only, um, if uh, or or like you're you're going down a highway uh, and there's a sign that says uh, exits two, three, and four are closed. Take this alternate route. So then uh, the SX lock um, that doesn't do that originally because I thought that originally that's well, so a shared, uh, shared exclusive lock um, gets you locking at one level of granularity. It means that if I have two readers uh, who want to uh, read from R1, because they're not going to conflict with each other, they can both read from R1 okay. at the same time. I thought intuitively that it performed that also. Oh, well, so I, I was trying to get across that okay. it didn't. That makes, that makes sense. Okay. So, yeah, so if you had shared locks here, then you get into trouble when you try to take a shared lock on the entire relation. So, yeah, so this is, this is a way of kind of signaling that someone is working. If you keep going down this way, you'll eventually find someone doing something. Okay, um, any other questions so far? All right. Uh, okay. Huge problem with locks is deadlock. So there's always the possibility that if you're not careful, um, one transaction might take a lock on an object, uh, then try and take a lock on a second object. Let's call them A and B. Meanwhile, transaction two comes along, takes a lock on B, and then tries to take a lock on A. Uh, so here you have two transactions sitting at the same time. Transaction one can't proceed until transaction two proceed, uh, finishes. Uh, transaction two can't uh, proceed until transaction one finishes. So this is a bit of a problem. So just like uh, just like we were talking about different ways of uh, of enforcing uh, serializability, uh, we can take different way, different approaches to avoid these deadlock conditions. Uh, we can take, uh, we can either try and predict the deadlock, or uh, at least uh, use, uh, use caution when, when programming to uh, make sure that we never get into a situation where there could be a deadlock, or we can uh, detect deadlock situations after the fact uh, and then react to them. Now, um, anticipation is... Uh, more tricky because that basically requires you to have a good idea of what the transaction is trying to do before it actually does it. If you have that, great. If not, um, detection is pretty much uh, the only way to do this efficiently. So um, the, the short version of this uh, is that you Every time a transaction tries to take a lock and fails to do so, um, we register it with some sort of lock manager. And um, this lock manager is going to keep track of all of the locks that are currently pending. And it's going to create a graph just like the one we had uh, comparing transactions. So if we have transaction one, does a read on A, needs to take a lock on A first. Uh, transaction two needs to take a, uh, or takes out uh, a lock on B. Uh, does a read, or does a write to B. Transaction one uh, tries to take a lock on B, uh, but can't. Uh, transaction two tries to take a lock on A, but again, can't. Just like we created edges going from uh, conflict, uh, going between conflicting operations, uh, we can draw edges uh, indicating that uh, one lock is waiting for another lock to be released. 
Here we have lock, uh, lock on A, waiting for transaction 1 to release its lock on A. Lock on B, waiting for transaction 2 to release. And we can translate those into a graph. Once again, if there is a cycle in this graph, uh, then that indicates that there is a problem. In this case, the problem is that neither transaction 1 or, not, or transaction 2 uh, can proceed until the other has completed. Uh, now, cycle checking is an expensive operation. Um, in general, you don't want to do a, a full check for cycles every single time a lock is, uh, is um, a lock of locks. But uh, you can have a background process that periodically looks at the transactions currently waiting in the system. And if any of them turn out to, or periodically looks at, uh, at um, the transaction in the system, builds the wait for graph, and tries to find cycles in it. Um, and if one of those happens to be there, then uh, we kill the graph. So simple example, got four transactions in the system. Uh, transaction one takes a shared lock on A, reads from A, exclusive lock on B, writes to B, uh, shared lock on B. Uh, transaction one takes a shared lock on B and blocks. Transaction three, shared lock on C, reads from C, uh, and so forth. Then uh, there's a uh, there's at this shared lock on B uh, now a dependency from T1 to T2. Uh, T1 is waiting for T2 to complete. Uh, T2 after the exclusive lock on C is waiting for transaction three to complete. Uh, transaction four is now waiting for transaction two to complete. Uh, and then when transaction three uh, takes uh, an exclusive lock on A, or tries to take an exclusive lock on A, uh, we, uh, it, it starts waiting for transaction uh, one to complete. So we have a cycle in the graph. Um, what next? Kill one of the transactions, you say. All right, fair enough. Uh, now, I'll be clear, unlike uh, George R. R. Martin, um, the uh, transactions don't actually die um, because the, the semantics of transactions are there pretty much at any point. You can restart the transaction. So uh, that said, yes. Um, one of the transactions has to die. Uh, which of them is it? Uh, well, that is entirely arbitrary. Um, uh, basically, you kill as many transactions as you need to break the cycle. And once that happens, um, you can restart the, the transaction uh, from the start, or possibly follow some sort of application-specific recovery logic. Um, I'm not going to uh, deal with that at uh, it's a little too uh, fine-grained for what we're talking about here, um, but that is a possibility. So this approach um, has a couple of advantages, a couple of disadvantages. Um, advantages are, well, there's no implicit, uh, we don't actually need to know anything about what the transactions are doing uh, other than when they need to take uh, shared exclusive intent to share, intent exclude locks. Uh, the, the API is well-defined, but the transaction semantics don't actually matter. And uh, the other advantage is that if there are no conflicts, uh, this behaves quite well. Um, there's no overheads, really. Uh, you need to periodically check for cycles, but in terms of overhead on the transactions themselves, it's actually, there, there's no major overheads. Uh, the disadvantage, on the other hand, is that every single time you uh, meet a transaction, uh, you need to, uh, every time you kill a transaction, you need to restart it. Um, and what's worse, cycle detection is a really, really slow process. So while there's no overheads on the transactions themselves, uh, the system needs to have uh, additional resources provisioned uh, for this background task that periodically uh, analyzes the weights for graph and tries to find cycles. Uh, 
So let's take a look at that particular uh, con and see if we can come up with a better way uh, to approach the problem. Um, and one strategy that we can take uh, is to accept the possibility that we might get a false positive uh, in exchange for being able to detect these cycles or, or detect these uh, deadlocks uh, much faster. Now, one trivial solution that we could take, one trivial approach that we could take is simply have timeouts. Um, if the lock is sitting there for more than some period of time, uh, kill the, the process. This is definitely going to create false positives because you're not guaranteed to have, uh, to ever actually time out. And depending on what kind of timeout you pick, there's also the possibility that the uh, transaction, that um, if it's too low, then you'll end up killing too many transactions. And if it's too high, you'll end up waiting a huge period of time before you actually get, uh, uh, get to detect the transaction. The other approach that we could take is to impose some kind of invariant. Um, and in this case, uh, we can impose an invariant on the transactions uh, so that to guarantee, to, to kind of force us uh, to, uh, to, to kind of require that any time we get uh, into a situation where we break the invariant, um, sorry, if we never break the invariant, uh, we'll never end up with a cycle. So there's a couple of uh, approaches that we could take uh, to this. Uh, one of which is to just uh, create a, a kind of monotonic property over the transactions. And anytime we break uh, that monotonicity, uh, anytime one transaction blocks on an older transaction, uh, we treat that as a potential cycle and kill one of the transactions. So for example, uh, if I have uh, transaction one uh, and then another transaction, an older uh, transaction two tries to block on it, well, that's perfectly fine. Transaction two is uh, younger than, or is newer than transaction one. Uh, transaction three, again, newer than transaction one. Uh, and transaction four, newer than transaction two. But then uh, we had that case where transaction one blocked on transaction four. Uh, well, transaction one is uh, was created first, therefore it's older than transaction four. Uh, and so once we get to that point, once we uh, recognize that, or once uh, transaction one is blocking on, on transaction four, uh, that violates our, our invariant. We have an older transaction, uh, sorry, we have an older transaction blocking a younger transaction. So um, scheme, so we can enforce this type of invariant in, in two ways. Um, the first is to, um, so if uh, the, the younger transaction locks, holds a lock on A and younger, if the, high, uh, the, the later transaction holds a lock on A and the earlier transaction tries to, to lock on it uh, and uh, would, would block, well, we're essentially preserving our invariant. Um, meanwhile, transa if transaction one uh, already holds a lock and transaction two tries to uh, acquire the lock, then we can, uh, we've broken the invariant. We have uh, T1 trying to block on T2. We can, uh, we're not guaranteed that there is some sort of, uh, of, of deadlock situation here, but by preserving the invariant, we can guarantee that we'll never uh, uh, we'll never enter a deadlock situation. So in this case, we'd kill uh, transaction two. So this particular approach uh, is often referred to as wait die because the uh, younger, uh, the older transaction is allowed to block on the younger transaction. Uh, in other words, wait while the younger transaction isn't allowed to block on on the older transaction. Uh, so it uh, dies. Um, you can take also the opposite approach, where um, so there's uh, an opposite approach here, where if transaction one already holds a lock on A and transaction two tries to acquire it, in other words. Right. 
Uh, so if transaction one already holds the lock, transaction two, let me rephrase this. Uh, so in the first case, we were essentially trying to preserve the invariant that an older transaction is allowed to block on a younger transaction, but a younger transaction isn't allowed to block on an older transaction. Um, the other approach kind of flips those two. The older transaction is the the younger transaction is allowed to uh, block on the older transaction. But if the older transaction wants to come in and take the lock, then we want to uh, kill one of those two. And in order to do that. We want to preserve fairness. We want to make sure that uh, transaction one is allowed to complete. And in order to do that, we're, we can avoid deadlock by killing the younger transaction and transferring the lock to the, younger trans uh, to the older transaction. And this is known as the wound wait protocol. Um, Questions so far? All right. Um, right. So we've talked about a couple of different ways to avoid deadlock. Um, first off, the um, we looked at, uh, at weights for graphs and how we could use weights for graphs and in particular uh, finding uh, cycles in weights for graphs in order to uh, detect, uh, in order to detect um, cycles. Uh, and we also looked at ways to avoid uh, lock, um, uh, avoid conflicts just by uh, evalu uh, keeping track of uh, invariance on the weights for graph, and essentially preventing us from ever uh, entering a situation where we could have a deadlock. Uh, any questions? All right, um, so that's all I have for today, and uh, we'll pick up on Thursday.